Welcome to this week's Who the Folk podcast. I'm Lonnie Goldsmith, the editor of TC Jew Folk. This week I talked to photographer David Sherman. We talk about the soon to be released Transfer of Memory book, how he broke into the photography business, and covering some of the biggest names in the NBA on this week's Who the Folk podcast. David Sherman, welcome to the Who the Folk podcast. Thank you for having. Okay, let's try that. Oh, I told you it was punchy. I'm having. Thank you for having me. You're yeah. welcome. Welcome. Let's try this again. <laughs> Three, two, one. David Sherman, welcome to the Who the Folk podcast. Thank you for being here. Lonnie, thank you. It's great to be here. It's great to talk to you. You have lots of stuff going on right now. There's an exhibit at the JCC, which we talked about. There's an article in TC Jew Folk, uh, which we'll talk about that in a sec. I think a lot of people know you for sort of two primary things, I think at least. Your your work um, as the official photographer of Target Center and shooting basketball there and all kinds of events, but your links and your Timberwolves photos, and also for the transfer of memory, the JCRC's uh, Holocaust traveling exhibit. And I want to start with that because there is a little bit of news around that, uh, that there is a book that's being produced of the Transfer of Memory exhibit. Um, I guess for starters, tell us a little bit about what the book is and how it came together in this form. Well, great. Um, I love talking about Transfer of Memory, and uh, the book is very exciting. Transfer of Memory features uh, 46 portraits of Holocaust survivors who lived here in Minneapolis and uh, St. Paul, and actually, uh, the one in Rochester as well. Oh. And um, so uh, we have the portraits, we have the stories, which were written by Lily Chester, and um, we are publishing a book of all that great content. So are the stories, like the words in the book, is it the same thing that like if people have seen the exhibits around this, actually, not just around the state, around the region. It's mm -hmm. uh, more than 60 sites across the upper Midwest it's been to. Is it going to be the same things? Does it expand on any of their stories or their history at all? The text is the same. Okay. But frankly, it feels different. Sure. Uh, on the printed page versus being um, in the gallery mm -hmm. uh, on the cards where uh, you sort of read it at your own pace as you experience the whole exhibit, uh, the book will give everyone the opportunity to experience everyone's story at their own pace and uh, one at a time and follow up however they might want to about uh, that part of, um, of those stories. And um, so it's, it's very exciting that it, the new format makes the images, makes the text, brings it all together in a very uh, powerful and beautiful way. How did you get connected with Transfer of Memory in the first place? Well, Transfer of Memory was an idea that I had, and I've said this many times, that um, I wanted to do portraits of Holocaust survivors before I knew that I could be a photographer <laughs> really? a as a profession. It just seemed like the right thing to do. Yeah. Um, and then as I... Uh, became a professional photographer and attended Holocaust uh, remembrance events. And at the conclusion of those, there's always a candle lighting ceremony where the survivors would come up and, and light candles. And every year there were fewer and fewer survivors participating in that part of the remembrance. And it seemed to me that we needed to make pictures and document um, the survivors' faces and remember who everybody is and was. And um, so in 2010, I uh, contacted uh, JCRC and um, pitched my idea to do this project. And within about 15 minutes, uh, Laura Zell called me. And then in about 30 minutes, we, I was in a meeting with Laura and, and Susie Greenberg. And we uh, kicked it off then, the summer of 2010. Wow. It's the, the B'nai Mitzvah summer of transfer of memory. Pretty much. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. So why was 
sort of the concept of the project important to you? Like you said, this was something you had sort of conceptualized before you even knew you could be or wanted to be a professional photographer. What, what was it about the the idea of telling the story in this way? Because the for people who haven't seen, the photos are very, especially in sort of the, the larger gallery format. There's 16 by 24 photos, you know, very they're big close-up portraits that are incredibly vivid and powerful alone. And then you add Lily's words to mm-hmm. it. It really, really gives vibrancy to the stories of these people. But why, I guess, why in this way? Well, I guess I'll blame Laura and Susie uh, for that. Um, <laughs> You know, I just wanted uh, a sponsor is why I went to the JCRC. I just wanted a sponsor uh, to legitimize this project, this idea that I had to make portraits of Holocaust survivors. Mm -hmm. And within minutes of us sitting and and kind of talking about what we wanted to do, uh, Laura and Susie looked at each other and said, well, we have to have words. We have to have the stories that go along with this. and we should ask Lily to participate in this, Lily Chester. And so it immediately, uh, the impact of Laura and Susie was felt immediately in terms of making this a project that went from just wanting to make really beautiful portraits Mm -hmm. of um, what I say, making beautiful portraits of a dying group of Jews to uh, something much greater that, really um, talking about the stories, remembering the stories, telling the stories, uh, really uh, giving life um, to these stories of survivorship. I mean, that's about right once you get Laura and Susie involved that the ideas flow and, I mean, they're kind of forces of nature in what they do. Yes. So I guess I'm not surprised. Knowing them, I'm not surprised that it took off in this way. Right, right, yeah. You know, one of the things that Laura had mentioned to me, in addition to, I mean, the number of places that it's been, the number of, you know, the the tens of thousands of people who have seen it in person, the millions who have read about it online in the news because it gets coverage everywhere it goes, um, is the fact that this book is happening because Knock Creative Agency is doing it for free. Correct. As a pro bono project. Correct. It's amazing. Amazing. Yes. Knock. Great agency. Incredible people, so creative, um, and through again, I'll blame Laura for that <laughs> relationship. Um, Not came to the table and said we'd be we'd very much like to do this project. We'd like to design this book on a pro bono basis. Uh, we had talked about this book for a long time. Um, Sheldon Chester, Lily's um, husband, Zichron uh, Alivracha. Um, Sheldon had this idea from the beginning. He was like, these these portraits are beautiful. We have to do an art book. It has to be a coffee table book. And so this was something from the beginning that um, we'd all been talking about. And uh, really at Sheldon's urging from the beginning to, to make a book. And so uh, it was always on the table and we always were talking about it and we'd raise the issue about you know, how are we going to design it? Who's going to design it? What are we going to do? And um, Laura brought Knock to the table, and it's uh, been really great. It's it's just gorgeous, this book. Well, well, it's amazing. I can't wait to see it. Um, and tremendous legacy for, uh, for for the Chesters and for you to, to have produced this. It's amazing. It well, really... Well, thank you. Yeah. I mean, uh, one of the beautiful things about Transfer of Memory, and the book will extend this, is when Transfer of Memory goes to a community center, a city hall, a library, uh, you fill in the blank, there's always programming that goes along with mm-hmm. the exhibition. There's uh, JCRC programming about the Holocaust, about tolerance education, about bullying. Um, so transfer of memory in itself is, is really special and beautiful. But when 
you take it in the context of everything that it brings to a community, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's pretty amazing. It, the one time I've seen it, it, it out in the wild, if you will, uh, was at, when it was at the airport. Right. In the, the, the sea concourse before the Super Bowl. Correct. Uh, and, and it was, was there with, uh, with other survivors who were part of the opening festivities. And, but just sort of watching the people who were, you know, going to and from flights sort of slow down as they walked past mm-hmm. to just not just have their, you know, headphones in and zooming to wherever they're trying to get to. They sort of slowed and at least took a bit of a second glance at it. Well, I love the airport. I mean, I love to travel. I love to travel for work, for pleasure. Um, so it was really exciting that Transfer Memory was exhibited at the airport. Uh, I feel bad that I don't get to spend very much time at the airport here because I really <laughs> it, like it's it. A, it's a great airport. It's a, it's a great airport. Um, but we uh, local to the Twin Cities don't spend much much time at the airport. Yeah. But I did get lots of comments, lots of uh, messages of people who had seen it at the airport and had taken the time uh, before or after flights uh, to look at the images, to read the text, to really spend time with the project. It's powerful. I spent a lot of time looking at it, and I'm sure I missed stuff, and I'm sure there is stuff that that I need to revisit mm-hmm. with it. So I love the fact that I can have it on my bookshelf now right. and, and be able to see it. Uh, and the... The book can be ordered online. We have a link in the show notes and on the article page about where you can order the book. It will be out very, very soon. Possibly, if you are listening to this the day it comes out, tonight is the JCRC's annual benefit. I, I've been told there, there may be copies, but I don't think anybody knows for sure. There is some printing stuff going on. And so there may be copies available at their annual event uh, tonight on June 4th. Otherwise, uh, order it online. We have the link for you. Correct. Yeah, that's right. We shall see. It's it's anybody's guess. Order, uh, order as they say about voting in Chicago, <laughs> order early and order often. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. And the proceeds go back to Transfer of Memory to support the project Correct. and the touring and the cost of moving it and setting it up places. So. Correct. Correct. Very important program. Now we're going to to switch sort of topics to you know the other side of what people know you a lot for is your basketball work, primarily, and you know, your target center work in general. And, and I think sort of the foundational foundation of that kind of goes to how did you become a photographer in the first place? Because I think that's you know is that something that you had always wanted to do? Because obviously I don't you don't get that job if you don't know how to shoot good pictures to begin with. My path to becoming a photographer is a uh, little non-traditional. I worked a uh, corporate job for 11 years out of college, uh, different sales and marketing uh, positions, and uh, got to a point where I just knew that the photography was something that I wanted to pursue professionally. I'd been doing it part-time uh, for about four and a half years before going full time. Mm-hmm. Uh, but since I was a kid, I loved taking pictures. Uh, I was intrigued by pictures. Um, it just was, uh, I, I was, I was taken by how much meaning and how much information can be conveyed in photographs. And um, there's just something that drew me to that and wanting to make photographs. And so I bought my first, what I say, my first real camera when I was in high school from uh, Harry Fisher from his pawn shop (laughs) in uh, in Sioux City. And um, uh, so uh, shot with that camera for a long time and uh, learned how to use the camera, uh, how to take pictures and um, Took a few classes here and there, one in college, a couple in college. Mm-hmm. Uh, finally, I took some uh, night courses at Hennepin Tech uh, as I was 
thinking about doing yeah. doing this full time, and something clicked, and it just really the 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 technology of the camera, the technique uh, made sense to me, and it became the language that I like to use to communicate. Has the technology and technique changed as as cameras have gotten more advanced as you've sort of switched for I, I mean I'm, I know you still shoot some you know some portraiture especially in film right mm -hmm. but but has has the techniques of shooting changed that much do you do you have to go back and forth between you know when you shoot film versus digital the the basic tenets of photography have always been the same yeah with the digital world we now can use Photoshop uh, to do things that may or may not have happened in camera, uh, or to uh, find things that we wanted to happen in camera but didn't. Um, so th the ability to post-process images in a different way, that's sub substantially sure. different. Yeah. But uh, the, the core pieces of photography, in my mind, are always the same. Who's the best athlete you've photographed, particularly like in game? Because obviously you've done like you do the portraits of the Timberwolves players, like the preseason, the headshot, those kinds of things. You know, you you look through the website, you've done stuff with Le, you know of LeBron, you know, portraiture of LeBron and all that. But like in game, as you're trying to capture a photo of something happening, what's the who's well, who, who's that person? Uh, who's that person? Um, I don't know if I have one athlete that stands out uh, that is the best, the most elite. Okay. Uh, but I can remember when uh, Vince Carter was at his prime and my friend Nat Butler from uh, New York was traveling and uh, traveling and shooting all of the uh, Toronto Raptors games. Uh, because he was chasing Vince yeah. in in Vince Carter in that way to get those monster dunks. Yeah. Um, you know, whenever we're given the opportunity to photograph a Vince Carter, a LeBron James, uh, you know, an Anthony Edwards, you just wait for that moment where they're gonna take off, right? And um, do that beautiful thing that we all are amazed at. Yeah. And my responsibility is to be ready and and uh, and uh, to uh, be able to capture that moment when it happens. Did you always did you always want to shoot sports? Was that always or, or was there a particular type of I guess genre of photography that you you enjoyed? that you enjoyed that really sort of was your entry to it? No. <laughs> I mean, I, I never thought I would be shooting sports. Um, in fact, uh, when you said that I was uh, best known in the Twin Cities as the Minnesota Timberwolves and Lynx photographer yeah. and transfer of memory, uh, I, there's many people in the Twin Cities that know me as a bar and bat mitzvah photographer, <laughs> uh, which is where I really got my start. Um, in fact, uh, today I made a portrait of an attorney for uh, their firm, and she told me that I also had photographed her bat mitzvah and probably her senior portrait. So... Um, I, Your career has been a journey. So it's been really interesting. So I do laugh. Uh, I did uh, get a smile anyway when you did the introduction about those two things. I mean, when I started, I thought I was going to be a traditional family photographer. Yeah. Um, when I started, you know, you, you thought, well, you do pictures, you do wedding pictures. And then as though that uh, couple's family grows, you do pictures of those kids. Mm -hmm. And then... Ultimately, you do the kids' wedding, and and it keeps uh, in a circle, and it keeps growing. Right. Um, but um, fortunately for me, my career did a little left turn, and uh, I'm very happy with that. So, 
in addition to Target Center, you're also the official photographer of U.S. Bank Stadium, uh, Treasure Island Casino, Resort correct. Casino. Yep. How do you? I guess how did it? Target Center was first, and the the, the basketball stuff was first. How did you? How did you get connected there? How did that come together first? Well, basketball was first. Uh, basketball with the M- the Timberwolves and the NBA. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the links followed. Uh, at the same time I started with the Timberwolves, I started uh, as a house photographer at Target Center. Uh, in those days, the organizations were very closely aligned, same, basically same office mm. um, in Target Center. So it was very easy to know everybody on both sides of that business. Um, so I've been the Target Center photographer since the fall of 95. I want to follow. Yes, I shot, um, uh, let me see if I remember this. Uh, I think it was uh, Jimmy Buffett, maybe uh, Thursday night, um, and then Matt Wexler's Bar Mitzvah weekend, and then Elton John. And so that was my very first weekend (laughs) as a professional (laughs) photographer. So I thought after that, while I was doing, I was feeling pretty good that that life would be a, be okay that uh so boy, what a weekend yeah and so started uh target center uh u.s bank has been just the last couple years okay and some of that is because of people i worked with at target center are now at u.s bank stadium oh. um and also it is the same management, uh, global management company, ASM yep. now yep. manages both, although they have independent management teams at both buildings. Right. It's under the same global. And uh, Treasure Island, um, also someone I used to work with, uh, went down to Treasure Island and asked if I was interested in uh, doing that work as well. And that's how i gotten, I would say, all of my work as I have have grown. People that I've worked with at one company have moved to another company. um, And I've been very uh, fortunate and blessed that they've brought me along for some really interesting and uh, fun work. That's, I mean, you, I mean, I'm sure the stories you could tell are phenomenal. I mean, you, you, you've seen, just looking through the basketball stuff on your website, you've seen a lot yeah. <laughs> yeah, in your in your almost thirty years doing this, so that's you 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 have seen unbelievable athletes, and I'm sure, and obviously, like you said, performers, and you know, it's it's sort of it's it's, I mean, it's got to be fun. Not that I'm trying to like force you to look back too much on your career because you're still you know I'm still working, still working. I'm not doing a retrospective. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, yeah. But it is fun to see. Uh, that I have pictures of Tim Hardaway and Tim Hardaway Jr. playing NBA basketball. And um, there's uh, uh, several players now that I'm shooting the second generation. So that that's kind of puts me back a little bit. Yeah, that's pretty yeah. cool, though. You also do, you know, you, you also do a lot of editorial work, whether it's portraits or like what type of, what's your sort of editorial style that you look for when you're either in a subject or a topic or what do you try to do? So much of my editorial work is client driven. Mm, So um, what I like to do takes a back seat, but I think they go hand in hand. In other words, my commercial or my corporate clients come to me because they like what I do. You know, I just want to get people to be at ease in front of the camera and uh, try to get uh, an image that captures their personality. And um, people look at it and they go, oh, yeah, that's Lonnie. I know Lonnie, you know. Uh, you're really, and you're present in the in the image. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're, you're engaged, you're with it, you like being in front of the camera. Uh, that's what I try to do. Uh, and I, I would say most of the people or many of the people that are in front of me for headshots or for uh, portraiture work are not excited to be in front of the camera. Uh, they do, um, they'd uh, rather be doing anything else. <laughs> so 
Uh, my, my number one responsibility is to have my subjects be comfortable, right. uh, trust me, and um, open up to me. I suppose easier said than done sometimes. Many times. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But you know, it's not personal, right? I mean, it's not about it's not a it's not about you. It's Correct. A, it's, you know, it's about them. Right. Yeah. Totally. So again, I mean, there's so many things that are parallel between uh, basketball and the the corporate work. For me, it's about preparation, and it's knowing that my equipment works and knowing how my equipment works um, so that when I have a client on set, they're my focus. Right. I'm not trying to figure out cameras. I'm not trying to figure out lights. Uh, it's dialed in. It's ready to go. Yeah. Uh, and I know the results. I know what I, how I want the results to look. Mm -hmm. Now I just need to get my subject to cooperate with me, to give me that. Probably easier said than done sometimes also. Also. Yes. <laughs> so what's the, not that you're not busy enough, but is there a big project or something on the horizon that, uh, that we should know about? Well, I'm looking. I'm looking. I'll take uh, any uh, suggestions. <laughs> um, there's... Um, there's some projects uh, I participated in the Jewish Artist Lab a few years oh. ago, which um, was really an excellent experience. Uh, I did that for I don't know, three or four years. Okay. And um, so there's some Jewish identity topics that have been percolating since that time okay. that uh, I didn't uh, have the opportunity to work on. And um, so those might be something that I'd that I'd like to try um, right. about uh, kind of centered around this idea of um, othering, uh, which uh, I guess is kind of an, a topic I come back to a lot um, in my personal work. But, uh, you know, what it meant to be Jewish growing up um, and uh, how did I anyway get my Jewish identity growing up yeah and uh, what were the important forces in that it's interesting i think there's probably a lot of uh, a lot of people who think about that and struggle with that i think there's a way to that work can sort of be be relevant for a lot of people whether it's your story or somebody else's story that you're telling through pictures i think there's a lot of a lot of there there well and for me i it was the artist lab that gave me the forum to to think about those mm -hmm. those topics about thinking back to my adolescence to my being a teenager you know how did i feel about growing up jewish yeah and um i never spent a lot of time thinking about what that was like only the only thing i thought about then was to get through it right you know and just uh uh be done with that so uh, we'll see. Yeah, that, that would be an area I might explore a little bit. And back to the JCRC work a little bit. I know you're all you're going to be on the educators trip to Europe. You'll be Correct. documenting Correct. that experience to Germany, Poland, and Norway. Uh, that's coming up in July. July, yes, very exciting. Um, seems a little weird to say that it's very exciting to be. <laughs> Planning a trip to visit Dachau and Auschwitz and Nuremberg. Right. But uh, it's really important to me. Uh, it's been important to me f since I was in high school to visit uh, those sites. Uh, I think it will help complete the work that I've done um, with survivors and Holocaust-related themes to actually see, um, to see Dachau, to see Auschwitz yeah. and Birkenau. Uh, I think it's going to be a really important thing. Uh, and I'm very excited to be going along with this group of educators that the JCRC is uh, taking and uh, document that trip and um, share those uh, with some daily posts and uh, um, uh, some uh, daily social media. So that's uh, in July. Yes. Well, we will, uh, I'm sure, help amplify that in some way. So we will, and certainly write about that uh, trip 
afterwards. So check out TCG folk and all of our stuff in the JCRC social media as well. And yeah. we'll uh, be some interesting stories to tell, I think, out of that. And really interested to hear from the teachers and how they're going to use some of this to come uh, to come back to their classrooms with uh, and use these sort of firsthand experiences to teach kids and, uh, you know, really convey the importance of this through this firsthand experience. Well, the, and the firsthand experience is so critical. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's one of the, the big themes behind transfer of memory is to introduce survivors uh, by face, by name, by story, uh, so that uh, people who are just learning about the Holocaust or, you know, very educated about it, that it becomes a personal kind of a relationship with that story. And once one becomes personal, then it's harder to shake. Yep. And it's, there's more of a drive to learn more and to invest more. And so, um, I really, I, I think that that's really true. Your point is that these educators will have these firsthand experiences and uh, it will be pretty fascinating to see how they take that and put it in the classroom. Yeah, it'll be fascinating to watch how they do it. And it's, uh, and it's not just Minnesota teachers. Uh, seven of the 18 are from Minnesota. Um, so 11 out of staters, even I can do that math. Right. Uh, <laughs> are, are, this is a, you know, a nationwide cohort that are, that are going to be on as part of this. So it's really, it's exciting to see. And obviously just so, uh, so key to the mission of the JCRC and their, their Holocaust education. Absolutely. Uh, l- since we brought it back full circle, we'll wrap it up here. The last couple of questions. First, what is your favorite Jewish food? Wow. Uh, we like to really try to stump you at the end. You know, I should have been prepared. People who know yeah. it, people who know it's coming, still it can still trip you up. Well, okay, I'll take uh, I'll take matzo balls. Okay, matzo ball soup. Anyone's in particular? My mother's, no, absolutely. Of course. Yeah, of course. Yeah, nice fluffy matzo. So balls. you're you're a fluffy matzo ball, not you're you're oh, floating yeah. out of sync. Yeah, I'm a fluffy matzo ball. Okay. Uh, I begrudgingly eat the uh, hard ones. Okay. Yeah. No. I get that. I don't discriminate either. So that's all right. I understand that. Yeah. Uh, what's your favorite Jewish holiday? Uh, Jewish holiday, I will say, uh, hmm, that's a good one too, because I, there's, I like them for different reasons. Sure. I mean, uh, I love uh, Rosh Hashanah. I love the New Year. Yeah. You know, I love that. Uh, I think I love the feeling of the fall mm. that, when when the, we can't quite figure out if we're leaving summer or, or it's going to get cool. Yeah. Um, you know, Rosh Hashanah becomes Sukkot very quickly. Yeah. Um, so that time is beautiful. Yeah. Um, and I love Pesach. I love the opportunity to bring, to be together with all of our family yeah. and um, and just share in, in all this uh, good stuff. Well, that's fantastic. David Sherman, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, photo exhibit outside the lines. Uh, we'll have a link to the article that ran on Jew Folk. That's at the JCC uh, in St. Louis Park until the 20th of June. Um, and we'll have links for the book and your other work on, on the show notes and on the article. And thank you so much for joining me. This was great. Well, Lonnie, I told you uh, before we turned the microphones on that I feel like I have now... Uh, achieved uh, a significant uh, accomplishment in my career being uh, on TC Jew Folk. Uh, I love the content uh, and it's a great honor uh, to be here and, and thank you for uh, helping me tell the story about uh, Transfer of Memory and uh, our exhibit at the uh, JCC. Thank well, you. You are incredibly kind. Thank you. Yeah. The Who the Folk Podcast is part of the Jew Folk Podcast Network, a product of Jew Folk Inc. Please subscribe, rate, and review the show wherever you get your podcasts. If you have suggestions for other podcast guests, please email them to me at editor at tcjewfolk.com. For our other shows, check out tcjewfolk.com slash podcast. Podcast.